Welcome to the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs Daily War Room Update. Um, we are on day 101 of the war with the terrorists in the Gaza Strip and with all of our other enemies around us. Um, it's day 100 of the war with Hezbollah and the terrorists in Lebanon and day something like that, um, without a definite and clear number, obviously, of our war with the Houthis in Yemen. We don't really have a war with, uh, uh, with Yemen, but uh, the Houthis, another one of the Iranian uh, um, tentacles, is nonetheless continuing to attack us, attacking the freedom of navigation through Bab el Manda and up to the entrance of the, Dead sea, of, of the Red Sea. So what we're going to start with today, unfortunately, we have to start um, really with our update from within Israel, um, not only uh, um, with uh, um, what's going on in Gaza, but a fatal uh, um, terror attack today in Israel um, with a number of people uh, um, being killed and wounded um, a terrorist from uh, um, from from Hebron managing to infiltrate into Israel and to carry out the attack, possibly with others, most probably with others as well. Um, and so that's something which is still being clarified at the moment. In Gaza, just going back, um, we've seen the continuation of the IDF operations on the ground, extending out, not only uh, um, solidifying our hold in the northern Gaza Strip, but also progressing and really expanding those activities to the south into Khan Yunus, into Rafah. And we've still seen, though, whilst uh, the Palestinians and their supporters or the terrorists and their supporters claim that food is running out, water is running out, electricity is running out, everything's running out. It doesn't appear that the rockets are running out. Yesterday, um, if you remember, just as we were closing the program, there was a massive barrage of rockets fired at only at about 550 to 600,000 Israelis who were sent uh, uh, running to their bomb shelters. In the north, we've seen the continuation of that war of attrition, Hezbollah attacking yesterday uh, uh, Israeli civilian fatalities and Israel responding, both attacking the terrorists themselves and their terrorist infrastructure. We've seen all that integration of of the, really the coordination between Hezbollah, Hamas, each one stops when the other one uh, wanted for them to stop fighting and then re-continuing uh, those uh, uh, attacks as, uh, um, as they see fit. Um, the Houthis, as we mentioned, have continued on with their activities in Judean Samaria, also a number of terrorist attacks um, that have carried on and the continuation of um, Israel's activities uh, uh, there as well. Um, and that really, um, based on that really quite broad, I think, uh, um, description of the attacks on Israel from without, from its from its neighbors and from its enemies, um, we're going to move to a different field. And for that, today we have a special guest who's joining us with advocate uh, uh, Sarah Um I've known Sarah for, for for many years. She's a lawyer um, in the in the Ministry of Defense, in the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Excuse me. She was a uh, um, Amongst her other accolades, she was the first uh, uh, Israeli to be appointed to the cabinet of the UN General Assembly, uh, um, uh, um, and, or the president, the cabinet of the president of the UN General Assembly, um, and and has really done amazing things for Israel around the world. And and so, firstly, thank you, Sarah, for joining us. Um, yeah. What we're going to discuss with Sarah, obviously, is is that Israel uh, UN relationship is it. Is it more hostile than our relationship with Hamas and Hezbollah? Um, are they any more friendly to us? Um, what's going on there? We discussed uh, um, Sarah on on Thursday. We had a, a on the briefing. We had a, um, a ambassador um, Alan a, a Baker, and we were discussing a little bit about the the proceedings in uh, at the ICJ. And uh, uh, and uh, 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 Ambassador Baker said something amazing that in the ICJ, Israel could never have a judge because we don't fit into any of the UN geographical areas, and therefore they can judge us, but we can never be part of them. Um, is that the feeling, really, of Israel at the UN? I mean, I, that I don't agree with at all. I mean, there's elections for judges, and theoretically an Israeli judge could be elected, like we have officials on different treaty bodies. They're all done through elections. We have uh, an, an Israeli official on the... Um, the Convention for People with Disabilities we've had for many years, um, a representative on the Convention for Discrimination Against Women. It's complicated. I, I won't go into the details, but in the UN, there are two different kinds of elections. 
One's just sort of a free for all in the ICJ. That's how it works. Um, and you, the, the different um, regional groups don't run specific candidates. Um, that actually gives Israel, believe it or not, an advantage um, when it's run out of regional groups. And we do belong to a regional group. We belong to the Western and other um, uh, groups we have have since 2000. I was, I was actually the vice chair of the sixth legal committee when I was serving at the UN as Israel's legal advisor. I was voted in. Um, but I think getting back to your original question, um, so so like you said, and first of all, thank you for having me. And it's nice to see you again. Maurice and I have worked for many years on many of these issues and related issues. Um, I, I just come back right before the war from a five-year posting at the UN, um, four of which I was Israel's legal advisor and counterterrorism advisor at the UN. Um, like I said, I, I served on the sixth committee, the legal committee, and was representative there for the entire committee. Um, and my last year, I had a really special experience that I was actually seconded. That means I was lent out to the UN and worked the first Israeli ever to work in, in the senior position of the secretariat um, for the president of the General Assembly. Every year, there's a different president of the General Assembly it, it from different regional groups. Um, they always pick advisors from all over the world, but it never even agreed to interview an Israeli. Um, and I think that had you interviewed me on October 6th and asked me about Israel, um, UN relations, my, my lecture that I had given until that point, um, I called it a tale of light and darkness, like the famous Amos Oz book. And what I would have said to you um, on October 6th was that the UN is not really a monolith, um, certainly not in, in New York, meaning the UN is this giant organization. And there are some corners that are very anti-Israel, perhaps the most anti-Israel corner would be in Geneva, in the Human Rights Council. And although human rights sounds all nice and good, and Israel is actually party to all the major human rights treaties and reports on them, the Human Rights Council, for example, is made up of 47 countries, um, many of them with egregious human rights records. They don't want to talk about themselves. So Israel is sort of the natural punching bag. And there are other corners like that, too, in the UN system. My experience at the UN was quite different. Like, for example, I was a counterterrorism expert and I had done many collaborative projects with the UN. They wanted experts in a new um, center they were setting up in Rabat, Morocco. Um, we sent an, an Israeli, uh, one of our, you probably know her, Gula Cohen. She's one of our um, best um, anti-terrorism um, uh, um, prosecutors in the country. Um, they wanted Russian speaking experts in Central Asia. We sent them those. Um, and in a lot of different places, we, I, I would say, I, again, if you had interviewed me on October 6th, I would say, if you're asking me, Sarah, what, what should be our strategy with the UN, I would say is find the corners where we can, we can showcase our strength. So for example, there's a whole committee on development and Israel is really a superstar and a powerhouse when it comes to water solutions and energy solutions. And that's a place we can shine in counterterrorism too, unfortunately had a lot of experience. We brought trauma experts and, and this and that. Now we get to October 7th. Um, and again, I, I just come back from the UN. Um, and, you know, on October 6th, if you would ask me if there was an opportunity, for example, for Israel to collaborate with UN women, when I was at the UN, it was an endless UN women um, uh, events. I, I run here. I founded a network at the foreign ministry um, that in, it, the Women in Diplomacy Network that um, basically partners Israeli women diplomats with their um, foreign counterparts here. And we, we meet on a quarterly basis to discuss issues of common interest, very much aligned with at least the stated goals of UN women, of advancing women and inequality. Um, there is work to be done there. And so, if, you know, UN women had called me up and said, you know, we want to we want to collaborate on a project. I would have been like, OK, where do we sign up? Um, you know, is, Israel cares about women's rights. We can do better on those issues. We might want to hear best practices. And then comes October 7th. Now, my role in October 7th was as follows. Um, because I had just come from the UN, I was put on the, in, in the foreign ministry works in emergency teams in real time. And in the past, because I was a legal advisor, I'd always be on the legal team. But because I just landed from the UN, I was put on our UN team. Um, and one thing that you do at the UN, whenever there's even a small incident, let's say, um, Hamas would fire just a couple of rockets into Israel. We would the first thing you do is report that to the Security Council. And it's a standard letter. Rocket so and so number of rockets were fired in so and so time of so and so type. They hit Sterot. Um, the damage that was caused was X. And then you call upon the Security Council to do something about it. 
Obviously, if it invokes a Security Council resolution, you would want to mirror that language in the letter. So here, after October 7th, there was a lot of work to be done. Um, but one of the thoughts that we had was that this is not just an event that we're going to write to the, the Security Council and to the Secretary General, um, but rather there are a number of relevant UN bodies um, that deal with subject matter that came up in the October 7th attacks. So, for example, um, you know, extreme violence against women and girls, UN Women, the umbrella organization of all women, its mandate is to to all women throughout the world, Israeli, non-Israeli from Zimbabwe, are all subject to the mandate of UN women. They, they try to advance women's equality. And one of their four major principles is protecting women and girls from violence. So we were going to write a letter to them. Uh, to them in, in, in conflict zones, right? No, UN Women is just it, overall the, the umbrella organization that deals with women. There's also another special representative of the security uh, of the secretary general that deals with sexual violence in conflict. And so we were gonna write her a letter, the special representative of, uh, of, of dealing with sexual violence in conflict, another special representative that would deal with um, violence against children, um, another UNICEF that deals just globally with children's advocacy. And again, the big, all these different senior actors in the UN deal with Every child or every woman, depending on their mandate, is, is part and parcel of their mandate. They, they are supposed to be their advocates, their neutral advocates. Now, something different that we did than, than a usual complaint letter. I mean, sometimes we have some visuals to, and we share them with the Security Council. Um, but here, as you know, part of what Hamas did was use as a tool of terror, endless videotapes, uh, photographs, you name it, that they dispersed on the internet internet to terrorize the Israeli public even further. So we didn't have yet, you know, the the IDF compilation of Hamas terror tapes, um, basically documenting in real time all of these egregious acts that they did, um, everything from sexual violence and burnings and, and, and all of these different things. But we did have already, as, as Israeli citizens, we had collected a number of maybe hundreds of these images. And so beyond just drafting these letters, which I, I had done hundreds of them during my five-year stint at the UN, um, also worked on compiling actual visual and, and video evidence for these different bodies, each one thematically. So the Security Council was gonna get images that were sort of, you know, the the low lights, the, the overview of, of the, the violence that happened on October 7th. UN Women was going to get images that related to women and girls and violence against women and girls, UNICEF about children, et cetera. Um, so actually, I personally knew exactly what images all these bodies received. You know, what prepared the letter, Ambassador Erdan, who sits in New York, our ambassador to the UN, sent them off. Um, they What happens at the UN, they then confirm receipts. So we received confirmation receipt with these different bodies. And then we waited and we waited and we waited. Um, now, in the meantime, a lot of these bodies were actively tweeting or however you call Xing um, about events going on, but with no comments or very little comments about what had happened to Israeli civilians on October 7th. So even the head, the executive director of UN Women, who is a Jordanian ambassador appointed by the Secretary General, um, in her personal feed, actually um, unbelievably on October 8th, blamed both Hamas and Israel Israel for the escalation. And this is before an Israeli invasion or anything. And what you see in both her personal account and the UN Women official account is just a one-sided narrative and ad, ad, advocating for the Palestinian, Palestinian women and girls. Now, I will say it is part of their job to discuss Palestinian women and girls. And certainly I'm not poo-pooing the plight of civilians in Gaza. It's not an easy reality. But when there were cases of sexual violence and rape in Ukraine or cases of rape and sexual violence with the Yazidi women or in other contexts, immediately, immediately because we're in the Me Too era, we're in the We Believe You era, they condemned it unequivocally, as they should, as they should. But when it came to Israeli women, there was silence. And there was silence for two whole months. Um, 
about so, the truth as well, there was silence. Uh, UNICEF, as you know, I have a, a particularly a, 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 a murky past with UNICEF. Um, and, and, and they too were silent, both the exactly. representatives here and, exactly. and UNICEF, and that, the head office, the chief of UNICEF. Everyone ignored what had happened to the Israeli children. Not a word. And, and continue to, by the way, don't and, and don't talk about what happens to the Palestinian children from Hamas either. They don't talk about human shields. They don't talk about Israeli children being displaced, being victims of, of horrific torture, of being hostages, of being orphans. None of this. None of this. You're, you're, you're exactly right. And, and even the head of UNICEF came in, did a visit in, in Gaza, did not come here. She she had a car accident, but there there were questions about the fact that she went to Gaza and did not come here. Um, a lot of pushback, I can say, about UN even officials coming and, and coming to see what had happened and coming to see with their own eyes. Um, it took three whole weeks for any senior UN official to even come to the south of Israel and, and take a look at what had happened. Um, usually, as you know, with the UN, senior officials, as they should again, rush to sites where there's crisis. That's, that's their job. That's the right thing to do. Um, and it begs the question, you know, like we say at the Seder, like, you know, why is this night different than other nights? Why why, are, why is the Jewish state different than all other states? Why is Jewish, but the, the blood of Jewish babies, women, children, elderly, anything like that, any different from, from the point of view of an, an international organization that's meant to advocate, defend, and, and really, once the events happen, then condemn all these actions that hurt these uh, spe special groups? I mean, I've done a lot of interviews on this subject. So I, I've dealt very much in the space of the gender violence. Um, and, and I unfortunately, part of my job having to put those dossiers together thematically meant sitting for the, the first week I sat from, I think it was Thursday, Friday, Saturday of that week. I sat for three days straight, um, just going through all the video footage, unfortunately, and picking out you know, kind of doing an editorial job, like a newspaper editor of picking out what some images like I couldn't use because like some images of charred children, you you couldn't really see, understand what you were looking at unless there was like an explanation. And so like those, I made an editorial decision for the first at least letter not to include. And later on, we obviously updated and there then the, the IDF, you know, uh, compilation came out too. Um, nice pictures that you just can't forget once you've seen them I, I mean i mean a lot of it and you know when i watched the idf film i was i was watching it from two points of view one because we were briefing diplomats and i obviously wanted to know what they were seeing as well but also um i wanted to make sure i didn't miss anything you know <laughs> in terms of the things i had sent um and some of those images just haunt me to i didn't sleep for about six weeks i, I could not sleep um, as a mother of children, my, my children were actually down in the South on the day of the attack and in lockdown. I had stayed behind with another child who had COVID. Um, so it's very much just very visceral thinking about the just by the grace of God, this wasn't, you know, it had, didn't happen to my children. But I think getting back to the question, why the silence? I've been asked this in almost every interview that I do. Um, as I see it, there could be three possible options. One is, I think, a rather simplistic answer that you could just say, you know what, it's anti-Semitism, plain and simple, full stop, and let's just move on with our lives. That That's just what it is. Let's call it by its name. Um, and, and that is a plausible um, answer. Um, I, I don't know if that's the answer. Um, another, which I think more gets into the UN mindset, where really, when you are at the UN, a lot of times... And this is after Arab Spring and the Syrian Civil War. There's still this mentality that everything that's wrong in the world and certainly everything that's wrong in the Middle East is somehow related and to be blamed um, on Israel. And it's somehow the fault of Israel and, 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 and what it does within the parameters of the conflict. Um, and I think that there are some, this is obviously not my point of view, that think that the the acts that Israel does in occupate, you know, what they call occupation, we can have a debate. Is, is it occupation even anymore? Certainly in Gaza, it's not. Um, they somehow justify this horrific violence. They somehow, maybe not justify, but make it, you know, like the Secretary General said, it did not happen in, in a vacuum. That kind of sentence means we can somehow understand the mindset of Hamas. Now, 
I think when you allow that to be that at, women's bodies are fair game, children's bodies are fair game for resisting Israel, I think that leads to a very slippery slope in terms of um, just excusing terrorism, not just in the Israeli context, but in all different contexts. For example, if we take the example of women. If you're saying that in certain circumstances it's okay to um, perpetrate extreme sexual violence and and rape against women um, for a what you think is a justified political cause, you know, how does that affect the women living under the Taliban or women living under ISIS or even Palestinian women living under Hamas? I mean, when someone is a, a rapist and they're using sexual violence. You know, a woman, a Palestinian woman who's going to oppose them in in Gaza is certainly going to her body is going to be fair game, too. So I think this attitude that somehow it's well, you know, what I had someone say, what were you expecting, is a very dangerous mentality. The third possible option, um, and I also think having spent five years at the UN but, is but very. On, sorry, if I may, just on on that on that question okay. of, of of the really, what were you what were you expecting? Did you actually have a, a an honest expectation that they would act in a different way? Their, their track record so far has been to show, in general, I think, pretty much clear bias against Israel for whatever reason it may be, whether it be anti-Semitism or just the general bias because of, I don't know, sometimes their, their, their background countries, their home countries, their nationalities, whatever it be, their, their political bias against Israel. The, the, the track record is bad. So why do we have any expectations? I mean, first of all, again, my October 6th self would have said to you, I don't think all of the UN is, is the same, and I don't think all UN bodies are the same. I mean, you have certain actors in the UN who are either neutral and doing their job. I, it, You know, it's one thing to be critical against Israel, as long as you're being critical like you are, you know, you're not, it's not a double standard. You're being critical in the same way you're being critical to all different actors. Like, for example, if you remember Maurice, you know, years ago, we were in tier three of human trafficking in Israel, and, and the criticism was coming to us. We were not doing a good job at it. Yeah. And if you remember, they appointed a special person in, in, in the Ministry of Justice, and she led amazing reform to the point that the UN actually recruited her, if you remember. I, I mean, there's a place where I would say, as someone who believes in human rights and, and us doing our job, it, it, you know, international criticism is, is in its place. And also, we weren't the only country being criticized there. And they had objective standards and we weren't meeting them. And, and there are places that every country can do better on. I mean, you know, there's no country that doesn't have any issue with inter-ethnic race relations, women's rights. There are a lot, I, 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 like, for example, women's rights. I, I would say as an Israeli woman, I wouldn't get up on a stage and say we are perfect in that realm. Um, the problem starts when it's just so inherent. And I think right now at the UN, given particularly Guterres, the secretary general's attitude, which sort of trickles down, this is this goes, many of the comments he's made are just, frankly, on, on the on, you know, really are on the verge of blood libels. Like the other day, he said, four out of five of the hungriest people in the world are, are, are you know, are in Gaza, are star, you know, starving in Gaza. And his organization itself had just put out a annual report on starvation. There are 8 million people in the world that are starving. Um, yeah. There's only two. It's like they claim that everyone has a basic human right to enjoy uh, um, clear flowing water in, uh, in, in, in organized uh, infrastructure and a basic human right to electricity when there are a billion people in the world who don't have those rights. Um, and no one is saying that it's that, that, that it's that it's a war crime. Nonetheless, as they accused Israel of uh, when uh, when Hamas damaged nine out of the 10 um, electricity uh, uh, um, uh, conduits to, to Gaza, that was already our fault and uh, and and really destroying a, a, an inherent human right. I, I mean, I'm not going to get you know, water is an important issue. I'm not going to get into into the nitty gritty of that. And you do have obligations under international humanitarian law not to go under certain things. I think more of the issue is just that they're lying. Trucks are going in. Uh, this The story, the whole story is a lot of the failures of trucks getting in as on the UN side. They go to sleep at 6, you know, 6, 7 p.m. They don't work all night long. Um, Hamas siphons off a lot of the food and, and uses it to fuel its own troops and feed its own troops. And, and it doesn't get to citizens. Um, and just pointing the finger at Israel 
and also just telling a story that isn't you know there's also a difference between food insecurity versus starvation and and you know whereas i i don't think anyone would say that the humanitarian situation in in gaza is rosy um on the other hand we're not talking about starvation and but all i'm saying is that you know i i, I think that pre october 7th I, I would have been cautious about sort of accusing the UN in a blanket sort of way about anti-Israel bias. Um, I'm thinking about that a lot more right now because I see these organizations that are the more neutral organizations, the ones that don't have a particular political agenda and just how the vast majority of them have failed to carry out their mandate and have shown a, a, a really clear anti-Israel bias. Um, the third point I was going to make actually before about why, you know, ignoring Israeli victims, I think also another thing that plays um, a very big role at the UN is politics. And it could be that heads of organizations that want their next promotion do some simple math and they know what the numbers are for um, getting elected or getting supported at the UN. And so doing the right thing and talking about Israel is not going to win you the popularity contest. And so in a sort of perverted, gross way, it could very well be driven by um, many of these actors own political ambitions within the organization. And I, I would definitely not rule that out. Um, the UN is a very political place. And, you know, oftentimes the votes are done by a show of hands. And and the way that it works, I, I, I sometimes when I'm doing a briefing, I have a graph of the different subgroups, be it the European Union, the Islamic states, the Arab states, and how those drive the vote. So even when you can have okay or even positive bilateral relations, once you get to a multilateral setting, this is very group think that drives the the uh, and consensus based um, approach that drives the votes. And that just leads to an automatic majority against Israel time and again. Which is why we, we even have countries with whom we've uh, signed peace agreements, Jordan, Egypt, um, even to an extent, the, 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 the Arab, the Abraham Accord uh, countries, who, who still don't vote in favor of Israel um, to the to the best of, of, of my knowledge, apart from there have been instances. Again, that's not a blanket uh, a statement, so at like, least example, in the, in the last, I, uh, in the last worked, year and a half. But there are some other examples. Like, for example, when I was working for the president, we had the first time that um, Israel, the president appoints um, different ambassadors to lead major negotiation processes. Last year was a particularly busy year because a lot of things had been pushed off from COVID. So we had 16 simultaneous negotiation processes, everything from the uh, the digital compact um, to, you know, you know um, issues related to uh, uh, disaster relief. And um, amazingly, um, for the first time ever, an Israeli ambassador, Ambassador Adan, was, was voted, was, was appointed by the president as one of the facilitators um, to facilitate one of these major negotiations in the General Assembly. And you always have someone from the Global North, so that would be Israel, and then from the Global South. So the ambassador, uh, the, the president um, appointed alongside Ambassador Dan, um, the Moroccan ambassador. And they actually sat on stage as partners and facilitated um, negotiations on pandemic preparedness. So there's like an, an example where you do have cooperation. And, and I would also say that sometimes because let's say general assembly resolutions are not binding. Um, sometimes Arab states that even have treaties with us, a little bit the UN is sometimes used by them as a way to kind of let off steam and, and take off political pressure of them of voting against Israel. So to add, actually to facilitate them having positive bilateral relations. So sometimes that you can kind of view it as that. Um, on the other hand, I think that there definitely is, I mean, there's no doubt that there is an inherent bias and there's a problem with all these countries sort of time and again voting against Israel um, and, and just singling out Israel, not believing Israel. I I heard um, uh, Mary Eisen a couple of days ago give a very good briefing and she said this terrorist attack had two elements, right? It was the one to just, the videos were really to terrorize us. And then they took, they put them on these platforms that then they disappeared from. So it was like to terrorize us and then to gaslight us and to lead to this sort of like Shoah-like denial um, of events. And, and that's really how we see it playing out. Um, and so very much feeling not just that they're ignoring us, but really gaslighting us of just not believing us. Um, you know, even when we even when we report 
with concrete. I mean, I, I know what we were given. It, it's things that a lot of my colleagues couldn't even look at. It, you know, we, we didn't just write a letter. This happened on this and this date. Torture, burnings with actual photographic and video imagery of this. Um, and still, we're not being believed. I, I, and, that... and still you have comments like uh, um, like for, from Francesca Albanese, the special reporter for for the for the UN Human Rights Council, who to this day is talking about the reported uh, um, deaths of I mean, civilians that, and, that was, and never when, actually when they... accepting that that the Jewish women, babies, children, everyone were murdered just for being Jews. And she still questions that to this day. So I'll, I'll tell you a, a, another major problem in the UN system. When we give them information, they always insist on what they call triangular verification. That it, it, So like, let's say I've, I've done this before. I, I give them a letter from the Israel Ministry of Education that um, there was a rocket attack from Hamas and 160,000 children are out of school um, from a letter signed by the you know, the director general, the minister of education, they'll take it from me. They'll say, thank you very much for these out. You know, it's good to reporting these allegations. And now we will verify it in our triangular verification process in our own system. Um, I can bring them a letter. I, I, I remember this from Soroka talking about how, you know, he talked about children. X number of children were injured. Now, we have privacy laws in Israel. So when we're talking about minors, they're not going to release their name. So they can give a description of 12 year old. And they say, well, we can't really work on this because we don't have all the details. And I'll explain them. Well, we're a democracy and we have privacy issues and we can't, you know, the, the director of the Soroka Hospital can't report on that. Now, at the same time, when the information comes from Hamas, even the Hamas Ministry of Health in Gaza, which is a Hamas run organization, they just take it at face value. Every morning I wake up and I get the OCHA, the humanitarian body from the UN's bulletin, which goes out to all the agencies. And that's the that's the basis of their information. And they just quote, like, you know, the Torah from from Sinai, um, what what they've been given from the Hamas Ministry of Health without an unequivocal fact. Yeah. Without all this trying or, or we'll report in real time. Five hundred people have been killed. Now, I, I know watching Israel having count its dead. It took three weeks for us to count most of the dead. And then. Amazingly, with I, I had a colleague who was saying she was a, a fitness instructor, and she said it takes a couple of minutes to do even to ask the soldiers to do 500 push-ups. You know, you don't just count to 500 in one second. Um, and and so these are things that just exist in the UN system, and um, but is it's that a the real problem. That they apply to everybody. Sorry, is that so? If you have, I, I don't know in. Uh, uh, around the world, if you have the Ukrainians reporting that the Russians now uh, uh, attacked a hospital and they killed X amount of people, do they put up those same barriers there? When do they accept just as 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 given fact what they're being told, and when do they question the the, the validity, the veracity of of that type of a report? I mean, I, I I don't represent the other countries, so I can't tell you what the internal processes are for accepting information or not. They claim that they have these safeguards in 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 you know in order, um, and that they use them to verify all information. But my my experience has been very different. Now, I I have to say that you know this all this whole discussion begs the question: Well, why are we still at the UN? That, that um, was exactly my next question. Okay, so I read what your. You see, we worked together for many years, so I read your mind. <laughs> so, what, what are we? What are we doing? What are we the, doing there? A, a uh, year and a, a, just over a year ago, they they sent the, the 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 question of the the continued occupation of the Palestinian occupied territories um, to uh, for an advisory uh, opinion of the ICJ, the same court that's now discussing the genocide. Um, they 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 take and adopt uh, um, 10, 15 decisions every year only against Israel, um, neglecting uh, the rest of the world. Um, we are constantly the, 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 the punching bag for the UN. So, so what are we doing there? What, what benefits do we get from being a member of the UN, to, of, of paying our dues even to this organization? Israel pays for that, for that right to be part of the UN. Um, and, and, and we're just being beaten up on all the time. So what's the point? So I still wouldn't go as far to say that it's time to to pull out. I think that there are a couple of things that we need to talk about. 
first of all, yesterday, uh, or I'm mean, sorry, last week on Friday, you saw the importance of Israel showing up in, and giving its narrative, even if it's going to be rejected. I think it's important that we stand proud as Israelis and tell our facts and our truth. If we play Monday morning quarterback with the, you know, the advisory pin in the wall case, which is different from a legal point of view, by the way, than this genocide case, because just to give the viewers at home a little bit of a difference, we're party to the um, genocide convention, as is South Africa. And that convention has a mandatory jurisdictional clause, which means when you join a convention, you're giving consent ahead of time that if there's a conflict, you're going to show up in court. Um, that's different than an advisory opinion, which is, first of all, a non-binding question being asked to the, the court. You're not really supposed to deal with political contentious issues of bilateral conflicts. And so we have an issue when those are taken to the court. Um, it's very different than giving your consent ahead of time in the framework of a treaty. So there was no, as you saw, the government here right away um, said we were going to be showing up in court. But I think there was really an importance even to ourselves, to sort of show up and 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 say our truth to to our to the Israelis to Jews, I I, I felt on Friday when when my boss Tal Becker started speaking, I, I I felt to be honest with you Thursday when I was listening to South Africa, it completely traumatized, like really like with just it was kind of underdoing all the work I had done for the last twenty years, um and just I, feeling I, I almost thought that that Tal was going to start with the with 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 the, the really the the amazing words of 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 of, of, of of the prosecutor in the Eichmann trial, that he's standing here on behalf of 9 million people who are completely being accused of a crime that they didn't commit. That's the other side that has committed the genocide and not us. And so Gittenhauser sort of stood up and said, I'm, I'm not speaking here for myself. I'm speaking on behalf of 6 million victims, 9 million victims. And, and really, I have to say, really a positive word, not only for Tal, but also for Gilad, for all of the team that... that that represented Israel that on, on Friday. We Amazing made work. We made history. Um, the first time a woman represented Israel in the international court, my friend Galit. Amazing. Well. And Galit as well. She did a great Israel. job too. Um, Amazing. But, but I mean, I, I think that there is value for us standing up and telling our our, our narrative. I, I think that there's value for the Israeli public, for the Jewish people. And that's number one. I think also, having served at the UN for five years, there's two other major things that are very important for us being at the UN. One is sitting behind the sign that says Israel and Israel being considered a state like any other state. In an era of uh, that all of Israel's enemies and opponents want to delegitimize Israel, it is very important that we continue to hold our heads up high and, and continue to act as a state like any other state. That's what we're seeking. When I talked about criticism, I don't have any problems with being criticized like any other state, but let it be like any other state. Um, and I think it's important for us to continue to, to participate, even if it's very difficult, in the community of, of nations. Uh, taking ourselves out of that game, I think, is, is really kicking ourselves the self-goal. Um, and then the other thing, which I think perhaps the viewers less understand, is that when you are at the UN, it's a very special experience that you're in but the only place in the world where you have access to 193 different countries. And when you're a country like Israel that doesn't have even diplomatic relations with many of them, that might be your only place that you're going to be able to connect, discuss many issues um, with colleagues around the world, sometimes plant the, peace for, the, the seeds for peace. Um, for example, when we woke up and found out that the Abraham Accords were, were happening, um, it wasn't that we didn't have um, the phone numbers and contact people in the Emirati uh, mission to the UN or in the Moroccan mission to the UN or even in the Sudanese uh, mission to the UN. Part of our work as diplomats is sort of always looking for these, these um, opportunities, also always looking for different channels of communication. And a lot of my work as an Israeli diplomat at the UN um, was not you know, you think of the formal rooms where the debates are happening. Those are actually kind of boring. Everyone reads speeches. It's actually not an, usually an interactive debate. We have some informal negotiations, which are much more exciting. The real action at the UN happens in the diplomats' lounge and in the different corners of the UN. And a lot of your work, is, particularly as an Israeli diplomat, are sort of planting those seeds of, uh, the seeds of peace, creating those channels of communication. And I personally 
I um, think it would be quite unfortunate to take ourselves out of those opportunities. Um, I, that is said, I'm, I'm completely sober and I understand the reality there. I serve there. Um, I a lot, my, a lot of my work, as was your work before I served at the, in New York, was in Geneva, which is even, I mean, it's kind of like if you like banging your head against a wall, that's a great place to go. Um, very frustrating and very diplomatic. Everyone with a smile and and polite, but just As stabbing they stab you in the back and exactly. slit your throat. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I have to say that my experience in New York wasn't exact. I was going expecting it to be like most of my mileage had been in Geneva doing different human rights re treaty reporting and um, you know universal periodic review before the Human Rights Council, um, sitting with the 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 the, uh, the the commissioner of the Human Rights Council. Um, very, very difficult work. Uh, the, UN, the UN in New York is a little bit different. There, there, Again, there are different areas and you have to know, I think to be a savvy diplomat and a savvy Israeli diplomat, thinking about ways that we can showcase our strength and not just to be on the defensive. I think sometimes we're in a different reality post October 7th, but I thought pre-October 6th, sometimes we got trapped into that game of cat and mouse and wasted too much energy. I, I think a lot of times as a mother, when you go into a candy shop with your child and they lie down on the floor and they're screaming that they want a candy, the worst thing you can do is give that oxygen. And I think sometimes we get pulled into giving oxygen to actors that want to give them attention and sort of get into this cat and mouse fight. Sometimes it just needs to be ignored and just not give them what they want. So, so whilst I understand that there's possibly, there, there is some type of benefit, I can I clearly understand that, for us being a member of the, of the UN, uh, uh, um, potentially as, as the wider organization. What about the idea of the UN organizations that are present here in Israel? I, you, you mentioned OCHA before as the, these reports that are put out that, that basically adopt uh, um, blindly the terrorist propaganda narrative and then are spread around the world. I, I, I tell everyone that uh, last year I, I, I had cause to read Ocha's weekly or bi-weekly uh, um, yeah. reports and bulletins that they put out. And, and, and I tell you, Sarah, that if I didn't have the context and the background, I would hate Israel as well. The reports yeah. are so venomous. They're so devoid, really, of any context. In some cases, devoid, really, of even the basic factual context, which is, which is absolutely necessary for the events. And you see events which you know and and sometimes of being personally involved in being completely uh, distorted. Uh, distorted. I mean, I, I was I was and, just we just looked at a report where they were talking about how many trucks got in, and and that's not true. It was you, you know they the number of trucks that came in was much larger. The, the number of trucks that then were able to go through because of Hamas or UN incompetence was a different number, but the trucks that actually went in was much higher. Or they what? don't talk about Hamas, or they don't talk about. T terror tunnels or they don't they, they have a whole they have a whole chapter on the dispossessed of people that have been moved but don't even mention the 150,000 Israelis that have been dispossessed you know they'll talk about a couple you know 10 people on the West Bank without even mentioning 100 over 100,000 Israelis and these are things that just give us such a one-sided thing I agree with you if you read that and it looks like it's written you know it's not like some of the tweets are very emotional or you can tell they're kind of political or biased, but they're sort of written very factually. And then, and, and you just can just take it as face value. And this is the problem with the UN and all the reports, right? When, um, you know, the, the, I will now the world health organization has become more controversial, but let's say pre Corona, the world health organization put out a report about the Zika virus. You and I wouldn't be sitting and saying, well, this must be a conspiracy or a bias. You put out a report about climate change um, you know, I think most global citizens will take that pretty much with with the, you know, the the UN stamp of approval, the UN uh, kosher mark. They'll take it at face value. Um, and what can be done about this? I think that we have to up our game. And this has been a lot of our messaging, talking to both member states of the UN um, and particularly donors of certain organizations, of just demanding that these organizations do their job. Um, in an unbiased manner, in a transparent manner, in an objective manner. And when they're not, you know, the organization either needs to be investigated or the, the CEO has to go. 
I mean, this would be the same in a corporation that's not it's, doing its job. You know, did that um, to an extent. Uh, there, there, there was a post that was put out by the by the by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, specifically targeting the head of OCHA, uh, uh, Lynn Hastings, um, and there was there thereafter reports that Israel had refused to extend her visa. But uh, uh, um, and 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 I was actually quite uh, uh, overjoyed um, that we'd actually started doing something to push back against these people that really are charging us with blood libels, um, with no basis, no fact, just as part of that terrorist propaganda. And yet Archer as an organization, the rest of Archer's employers, con um, employees continue to work. They continue to uh, put out the same reports. Nothing seems to have changed. And really, it seems that we've that, that we're missing a, a little bit of the ball there. I, I mean, I think we're at the beginning of this switch in attitude and we're going to be, you know, more, we're going to have little to no tolerance for these kind of extreme biases. Um, those actors that are working in, in a unbiased manner, we'll be happy to engage with them. That's our job at the foreign ministry. Um, those that are acting just completely biased, uh, they, they will get a closed door um, or they won't get their visa renewed or they, they, they will come up against very clear messaging from us um, that this is just not acceptable and things have to change. Uh, we're in a totally new reality. Um, what was what was October 6th is not going to be what's October 7th. Um, and, and that doesn't say that we're, we're going to boycott the UN, let's be clear. And again, if there are actors that are acting objectively, fairly, um, we, we have no problem engaging. Um, if they're if they're just doing their job, I mean, right now, you probably saw the headlines the the special representative of the secretary general for sexual violence in conflict she didn't do what un women did she didn't start tweeting about one side or the other um she had a genuine interest to come and visit and she's she's going to come and visit and see what happened and we're hoping that we can have positive engagement with her it would be very important if sh she could talk objectively about what she sees here what she, you know and and the different um be it victims hostage families going to the South. Um, we need UN officials who, who are trusted to be talking about this. That's their job. Um, and certainly if, if there are actors that are willing to engage, we we, we welcome them. Um, we welcome them to do their job. As, as you know, uh, um, just for our viewers, I had a, I had a very, uh, uh, or a particularly bad experience with UNICEF as an officer in the army, really representing Israel and, and leading the talks uh, with UNICEF after they accused us of of committing crimes against humanity and war crimes just for the fact that we were prosecuting Palestinian miners, some of them murderers, um, and that for them was was clearly immoral um, and 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 a war crime. And my discussions with them over over a year and a half were were, were unfortunately very very much part of my image of the UN, of its intransience, of its inherent bias, of its really hatred of Israel even when provided with the real facts, their inability to admit that they were wrong in any way, shape or form, and, and to even retract things which were, which were clearly wrong. And that's never happened. And so here we are 10 years later um, with the same UNICEF, and it's the same UNICEF that in the meantime have done nothing really to fight for the cause of Israeli children who have been targeted by the rockets from, from Gaza, um, have done nothing about the, or, the weaponization. Or, or Palestinian children, for that exactly matter. That, the weaponization and the recruitment of the Palestinian children as child terrorists. They've said nothing. They've whitewashed everything. And yet we have the UN Secretary General considering whether to blacklist Israel already a year ago and then really giving the terrorists the, the, re, the, exactly what they wanted, the, a, a threat from the Secretary General. Well, if the situation doesn't change in the next year, then I will have no uh, uh, um, no uh, 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 no ability to avoid uh, blacklisting Israel. So that's really encouraging them to send more children to die because then they get there and they receive their political goal. And I would imagine that's going to be the goal now. But and so it doesn't seem that on that front there are organisations which, for many many years, uh, decades, I would assume, have uh, have really been completely uh, biased against Israel. And and I don't think that. Uh, uh, um, that I really understand as to why we continue uh, um, to to play along with them. Um, 
unfortunately, Sarah, whilst uh, I believe that we could continue discussing on this uh, um, for a very, very, very long time, um, our time has run out. Leave us, please, with one positive note, nonetheless. We try to leave not, not on, a, on a negative note. On a positive note of, of what we can do, how we can possibly change this uh, uh, UN body, how we can, as you say, showcase our strengths rather than being dragged down into their inherent bias. I mean, I think right now at the point that we stand, we have to put pressures on our, our respective government. Um, you know, our tax money goes to the UN at the end of the day and making sure a demand that, um, you know, the different UN bodies are doing their jobs fairly and objectively. If the leadership is rotten, that that has to go. When when new leaders are being expe elected or, or chosen, um, their attitudes towards Israel have to be checked and, and may, make sure that we're not going to be having political advocates. Um, I, I don't know if, if your viewership is, is around the world. This really is, is something important. If your country is one that's a, a, a donor nation, um, there should be engagement about that, about what kind of messaging is going on at the UN. Because at the end of the day, the UN is a member state driven organization. And, and at the end of the day, you kind of have to look at yourself in the mirror in terms of the membership of what goes on at the UN. Um, and so that's something that I think we can all think about and work on each one in our in our own corner. Um, as, as Jews, uh, you know, I think, and, and as people who have their moral compass on right, um, we we have to both bear witness and tell the truth um, and, and hold our heads up high. I, 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 I'm feeling in these last couple of days that this is my privilege as an Israeli, and it's different than all the generations that come come before us. You know, I'm I'm a grandchild, great grandchild of victims of pogroms, the Farhud of the Shoah, and you know, for example, the women's issues. I think about all the generations of, of great grandmothers, grandmothers who, who lived with the shame of being victims of that kind of violence, and and couldn't talk out loud. And and just like we have the IDF, and we can defend ourselves even after this horrible attack, I and mean, go attack Hamas. And it's the privilege of having our own state and having self-determination. It's also my privilege as an Israeli woman, Israeli representative, to hold my head up high, not be ashamed, and, and to tell our story. Um, and to show up at the UN and, and make everyone listen, even if they don't want to. So I think I'll end on that note. I think that um, really is an amazing message, Sarah. It, it, it really is going with our, our truth, standing tall, standing proud, because we really do what we need to do in order to uh, implement international law. We abide to the rules. And whilst we have our detractors, there's nothing better than standing up and saying, this is what we do. This is the law. It's all in that program. I mean, I'll, I'll just end, Maurice. I think both of us who've worked as, as legal advisors for years, and it's really our life mission. I had such a moment of pride of, of, of everyone in Israel and Jews around the world and, and, and Israel supporters around the world seeing what kind of quality people are behind the scenes working and, you know, what kind of professionals and devoted professionals are. And, and it was a moment of true Israeli pride. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think, I think it's something we need to, we need to be proud of and we need to keep it up. Um, it, you know, it's, 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 it, it's, it's our strength. It's not our weakness. And so that's, that, that's what I, the message I would want to leave you all with. And so again, uh, um, we'll, we'll end on that note. And, and again, a thank you to Tal and all of the team, to Galit and to Gilad um, and to Malcolm Shaw and to the others uh, um, who represented us with a, a, such strength um, on Friday. Um, for anyone who didn't see uh, the appearances, you can find it on YouTube, Israel in the ICJ. Really, it is not only a legal discussion, but it gives you a, a general basis of knowledge of how to deal with the different uh, attacks on Israel that are being made in all of these different forums. Um, Sarah, thank you for taking a, really a lot of your very, very valuable time um, to be with us. Um, and uh, uh, really, thank you very much um, to our audience. We will be back with you again tomorrow at four o'clock um, Israel time. In the meantime, uh, uh, keep safe all around the world. And, uh, um, and have a good morning, afternoon, evening. Goodbye. Everyone. Thank you, Maurice. It was a pleasure. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you again.